welcome to the session on Romanesque art. Unlike the terms like Greek, Egyptian or Byzantine, which all refer to specific geographical and political locations, the term Romanesque hardly gives us a clue in that direction. Romanesque literally means in the Roman manner or Roman-like. It implies that Romanesque art shaped itself by borrowing heavily from the classical Roman art. Romanesque art in this sense followed the same fold of early Christian and Byzantine art. That apart, it also followed the Carolingian, Ottonian and Islamic traditions as well. This assimilation makes it a very distinct artistic phenomenon. The Carolingian and Ottonian suzerainty looked at art as the manifestations of cultural and political programs of the royal courts. Romanesque art, on the contrary, developed as a popular expression that proliferated all over Western Europe in 11th and 12th centuries in a variety of regional styles, yet they are interrelated. This dual nature but comes to lend it a coherent style which in fact was a resultant of many historical factors. We will have a cursory look into some of the most important historical developments that shaped the flowering of the Romanesque art. During the 10th century, there were endless troubles of the terror, endless disasters of various kinds and a famine resulting from the frequent invasions of the Normans and the Magyars. However, at the same time, there was also an ever increasing spirit of Christianity in Europe in the same century. Christianity was close to win over everywhere in Europe against the pagans. This triumph of Christianity had forced the entire Europe to live under extreme fear of the prophetic end of the world which was believed to occur in the year 1000 AD as laid down in the Bible. But as we know well, the year 1000 had a smooth passing without the apocalyptic end. Those who feared the dreaded days did not begin to disbelieve what their holy book says. On the contrary, they were left with great relief and a heightened spirituality. This intense religious spirit had an immediate expression. A large number of people set on pilgrimages to visit sacred sites at far distant places and its violent expression was increasingly felt in the in-repeated holy wars better known as crusades, Christianity against Islam to drive out the latter from the holy land of Jerusalem, the central place in the life of Christ. The heightened religious zeal further demonstrated itself in the sudden increase in the number and size of monasteries which largely came to characterize the medieval life. Apart from this religious fervor, we must bear in mind that a peculiar economic and political system of the period had played an equally important role in contributing to the Romanesque art. At the end of the early medieval period, Europe largely remained to be an agrarian society with the existence of feudalism particularly in France and Germany. As a result, there was no centralized political authority in which king did not rule but led military in the war. At the same time, there was no military under the king's possession but it was provided in the time of war because the land owning lords granted some of their property to knights, mostly to cavalry officers. In return for these fiefs or feuds, as the granted lands were called, the knights provided military services to their lords. This was operative on a complex system of personal bonds called vassalage, which extended all the way back to the king. In the bottom level of this pyramidal system, there were a large number of powerless peasants called serfs who worked in the land. In this feudal system, not the king 
but the great landowner rules as king as independent territorial lord. Hailing from the important positions in the army and in the ecclesiastical hierarchy, the independent landlords constituted a master class threatening the wealth and power of kings. Of this new master class, bishops and monks of monasteries came to rule political authority that finally led Pope to emerge as a unifying force throughout Europe. It is this political and economic system embedded in feudalism that caused Pope to call for crusades. Because the church held more land than any single lay ruler, some bishops were great feudal lords and many bishops and abbots were members of ruling families. So much so that the army of crusades was astonishingly larger than a political ruler could have raised. The period also witnessed great technological advances in agriculture. The increased efficiency of milling machinery and better iron flows that dug deeper furrows stimulated the farmers to produce more foods than what was required for home consumption. It demanded new openings of markets to sell out the excess. New trade routes were thus treaded linking Europe commercially and culturally stimulating the revival of urban life against the ruralization of culture of the past in which life was more concentrated on villages. Keeping pace with these developments, the masonry techniques were improved with the introduction of better tools such as saws to cut huge stones required by the new experiments in architecture. The huge imposing structures that characteristically punctuated the landscape of the period were made of well cut straight edged stone blocks shaped by the newly developed saws. Architecture The Romanesque architecture was generally erected on the model of Roman basilicas. The ground plan was usually the same with a central nave leading to apse and two ales at the side. Sometimes this simple plan was enriched by a number of additions. The general impression of the Romanist church is nevertheless very different. With a few decorations and a few windows built on firm unbroken walls in huge stone blocks, the Romanesque architecture evokes a sense of massive strength. However, in the beginning, the Roman engineering technique in constructing roof with timber continued as in the case of the church at Pisa. But it was later given up since it was felt it devoid of grandeur to the impressive stone buildings. Moreover, there was practical reason to leave it. The timber roof was dangerous as they caught fire in many a time during the political troubles of the 9th and the 10th centuries. This had forced the period to engage in ceaseless experiments with new roofing techniques in stone. Colossal pillars were thus erected to rebuild the Roman basilicas on both sides of the nave to make them strong enough to carry the great weight of heavy stone blocks used for walls spanning the nave. It required tremendous physical labor and meticulous calculation and caution. Norman architects of England therefore gave up this Herculean task of raising the early tunnel vault. Instead, they treaded a new path. Seeking the new technical possibilities, the Norman architects replaced the heavy tunnel vaults with a number of firm arches spanning the whole distance of the nave. This was done with multiple arches or ribs spanning crosswise between the pillars on either side of the nave. The triangular space left between the ribs was filled in with lighter materials. This technique came to be known as rib vault was soon to revolutionize the conventional idea of architecture 
and its introduction can be traced as far as the Norman Cathedral of Durham. Sculpture There had been a pronounced absence of production of large scale carvings in stone everywhere in Europe during the long period between 5th to 10th century. Now, perhaps responding to the innovative impulses in the stone architectural activities, stone carvings increasingly appeared in the Romanesque church in central and southern France almost simultaneously like a spontaneous flowering after a long winter. Still, it strikes a different chord in many terms. Unlike the Greco-Roman traditions, the field where Romanesque sculptures appear is reduced to the columns or capitals of the church interiors and to the space adjacent to the main exterior entrance of the church. Again, we must note that the basic idea that shaped the Romanesque sculptures was not to decorate the stone edifice. Rather, the sculptures were sought to serve certain definite function rooted in the idea of conveying messages hailing from the Bible. The field above the lintel of the main entrance of the church consisting of large semicircular relief is a hallmark of Romanus portal. Tympanum, as it is usually called, had probably derived from the lunet of the Byzantine murals. Tympanum has further carvings on its jams. It set itself as an inevitable architectonic form by 1100. Let us have a look at the narrative content and significance of the tympanum reliefs with a few examples. More often than not, Christ is shown looming large in the center of the tympanum with many figures on either side of him in a strangely smaller size and the narrative is recurrently associated with the last judgment or related themes. One of the most striking examples stems from the west portal of the Cathedral of St. Lazarus, Autun in central France. The relief is signed by Gislebertus, one of the few Romanist cultures to name. It implies that he was an exceptional master whose artistic brilliance was recognized in his own time. Carved in C1135, the relief represents the last judgment as described in the Gospel of St. Matthew. An awesome figure of the enthroned Christ towers above a world that is densely populated by tiny figures. On his left are shown the souls of the dead sinners being weighed in the balance in order to gauge the amount of their sin. On his right and in the lintel below are the blessed souls rising excitedly and fearfully from the tombs. They are welcomed by Saint Peter to the heaven with a huge key while the damned on his left are pulled into hell by heinous devils. There are some more terrible scenes. The miser weighed down with his money bags, the adulteress with snakes gnawing at her breast and the screening souls gripped by giant pair of claws appearing from nowhere. Above them are Archangel Michael with souls clinging to his coat tails for protection is weighing a soul. A hideous devil opposite him tries to tilt the balance in his favour and a small devil sits on a scale to weigh it down. In another part of this large composition of cataclysm, scholars have identified two figures of pilgrims among the saved. One wearing the cockle shell badge, the symbol of St. James, to imply that he has been redeemed by his pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, a famous pilgrim church in Spain devoted to St. James. Other wearing an image of cross to indicate the spiritual reward he received for a visit to the holy land of Jerusalem. 
We can now shift our focus on another example of a plethora of carvings. It hails from the tympanum of the pilgrimage church at Basile, constructed by Cluniac order. Here too, Christ in central axis is seated in majesty. Traditionally confined to mosaics and murals in the apse, the theme was now brought down to the laity in three-dimensional carving. Carved around the year 1125, it represents Christ as Pentecost with the fires of the Holy Spirit radiating down to the apostles from the outstretched hands of the Christ. It is meant to suggest that he sends forth apostles with gospel books on their mission to convert the pagan, heal the sick and cast out devils from the possessed. All of them are shown in the lintel and the inner archivolt. On the semicircle of the outer archivolt, there are figures of men engaged in the labors of the months and also the signs of the zodia signifying Christ's rule over the cycle of the year. Among the many small figures of the unregenerate, there are men with heads of dogs and men with wing-like ears as inhabitants of distant lands. This Cluniac pilgrimage church at Vesele had attracted thousands of pilgrims because it was believed that it preserved the relics of Saint Mary Magdalene. Another interesting piece of carving is the portrayal of Eve, which was originally part of the north portal of Saint Lazarus Cathedral, Auton, mentioned earlier. As we know, she is an image of original sin. In her depiction, the artist Gislebertus arranged the body in an arbitrary way. Her torso is turned frontal while the head is in profile view so that her sensuality could be better expressed. In the same vein, we must note that her sex is skillfully concealed by exploiting a tree or plant in the garden. Her right hand is raised to her cheek in a gesture of shame but the left hand still continues to pick the forbidden fruit. A pictured couple of Adam and Eve as victims of original sin is another marvelous expression of Romanesque art. Like the last judgment, original sin as the battle of good and bad was a favorite theme of the period. This thematic preoccupation of the Romanesque art seeks to convey a central idea that there are only two roads before human world. One leads to heaven and the other to hell. Christ in the central axis of the tympanum therefore comes to divide the good from the evil, the blessed from the damned. Apart from that, it is more intriguing to note that such division is rendered with specific emotions of horror and tenderness with dramatic intensity. Painted in brilliant colors, these terrible images were made to put them into the view of the pilgrims and the common faithful who crowded these churches around the year. Living in a world which runs through a surfeit of images of various kind, it would be difficult for us to imagine what impact these images of endless terror and eternal bliss would have made upon the medieval mind. However, we have some glimpses capturing the visual experience that these apocalyptic visions had exerted on their beholders. We have moving verse written by a late medieval French poet, Francois Villain, referring to such images of Romanesque facade. I am a woman, poor and old, quite ignorant. I cannot read. They showed me by my village church a painted paradise with harps and hell where the damned souls are boiled. One gives me joy, the other frightens me. As Arnold Hauser says that to intimidate men's mind, art could have devised 
no more effective method than these images which are recurrent in Romanesque stone carvings and paintings. Manuscript illumination. In the reliefs discussed so far, we can observe that the classical sense of form was given no room. Rather, they distort the sense of reality by eliminating the volume of form and depth space. Extremely slender and emaciated body consumed by the fire of faith predominates the visual field. However, it was not a new beginning but originated from the late Byzantine art and continued with unprecedented stress on the ethereal appearance along with the calligraphic swirl of drapery in certain instances. Whatever it may be, such stylistic ordering has parallels in mural paintings and book illuminations of the period. One of their finest manifestations with regard to mural hails from the apse of the chapel of Berze la Ville in Burgundy of early 12th century. Apse and dome of this Cluniac church are predominated by a large painted image of Christ in majesty, framed in mandola. He is flanked by apostles with a considerable emphasis on Saint Peter who is shown receiving a scroll from his Lord with huge key on his other hand. Because the Cluny had devoted itself to Saint Peter, Cluny's foundation charter states that the church is answerable only to Rome and Pope, the heir to Peter's throne. The elongated bodies and delicacy of lines and brilliance of colors contribute to animate the whole composition. Christ in majesty was very much a conventional theme in the apse for centuries. But what makes the Romanist period different with the same image is that from the abode of the apse it brought it down to the stone carvings of the church partials. Similar depictions are recurrent in the book illuminations as well. A page from the illuminated Bible of an important monastery of Stavelot in Belgium of late 11th century comes to serve as an interesting example. The way the body is draped across is discernibly graceful by virtue of firm, rhythmic lines which shows the sure hand of the artist. Framed in an altered mandola, here too Christ is surrounded by apostles but in symbolic forms. The angel for Saint Matthew, the eagle for Saint John, the lion for Saint Mark and the ox for Saint Luke. It may be noted in this context that there is a translation of the same idea in stone carving in the tympanum of a church in southern France of late 12th century. The preponderance of the theme of majesty accounts for certain interest that the period had encoded in it. Look at the figure showing an illuminated manuscript of Annunciation of the mid 12th century. The two figures look almost stiff and vertical. The Virgin is shown frontal with raised hands in astonishment as the angel Gabriel appeared all of a sudden before her. The dove of Holy Spirit descends on the Virgin from sky. The angel is shown in profile but the wings frontal. The figures are set against flat neutral background that is entirely devoid of any suggestion to the locality where the event is taking place. Its void of natural resemblance to form and space is not to be looked at as a demerit, rather it is a merit which lends a great deal a ring of mystery to the imagined world of a mythic past. The arbitrary arrangement of figures, the rhythmic lines and the damp fold drapery and all are effective devices to obtain the desired spiritual air. Some of the most striking imaginative ventures in the book illuminations of the period are to be seen in the decorated initials. Variety of animal and floral motifs 
more often appear intertwined with human figures and the narratives which is hardly so in stone carvings and murals. Such initials were handled with special wit and astonishing skill. The world of flora and fauna that inhabit the initial usually covered the chunk of the page. Such importance given to animal or floral world nevertheless cannot be accounted for any specific biblical narratives or religious connotations. A few scholars have interpreted them as the products of sheer fancies and follies, reflections of a new secular and worldly impulse in medieval life. Sometimes the subject matter of the initial illustrates the adjoining text, sometimes their fiercely twisting shapes convey only a general sense of struggle and confrontation akin to the heroic conflict of the saint's triumph over the forces of evil. The medieval manuscript tradition reached a high point in the 12th century. The emergence of numerous churches and monasteries had resulted into an unprecedented demand for books for the private reading of monks and the giant illustrated Bible for reading aloud in the church. The great Bible illuminated by Master Hugo for the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds in about 1135 comes to serve as an important example in this regard. Figures are clothed in damp fold drapery with firm outlines, strong colors with expressive gestures and intense gaze. Originated from the Norman Scriptoria in England, this style by the mid 12th century became typical of the international language of Romanesque painting. Master Hugo's Byzantine style counts as one of the finest manifestations of a deep felt and widespread Byzantine influence on Western Europe during the 12th century. Now let's summarize. Byzantine imageries continue to exert its influence on the art of the medieval Europe with some specific stylistic features of its own which is identified as Romanesque meaning in the Roman manner. Feudalism, monasticism, crusades, revival of urban culture, new opening of market etc. had linked Europe with new trade routes. All these developments evoked tremendous amount of experimental spirit that revolutionized the mode of production in agriculture and architecture. A corresponding expression was strongly felt in the field of sculpture and painting. The images of the period are however striking with their dramatic expression of endless terror and eternal bliss associated with the apocalyptic vision of the world. Here are some questions for you. Romanesque architectures are generally huge and heavy with a few windows and doors. Why? Next, what could be the possible reasons for the recurrent choice of the subject like the last judgment in the sculptures of the Romanesque period? What was monasticism? How did it influence Romanesque art? Books for reference. Mayer Shapiro, The Romanesque Art, Selected Papers, George Brasiler, 1993. George's Duby, Art and Society in the Middle Ages, Palti Press, Cambridge, 2000. Hugh Honor and John Fleming, The Visual Arts, A History, Prentice Hall, Inc., Englewood Cliffs, NJ, 1984. E. H. Gombrich, The Story of Art, Faden Press, London. Penelope J. Davis, Walter B. Denny et al., Janssen's History of Art, The Western Tradition, 7th edition, Prentice Hall, NJ, 2007. 
Paul Grossley, The Early Middle Ages, in Dennis Hooker edited History of Western Art, Pippet Press, Box Tree Limited, London, 1994. Now we conclude this session. We will meet again for another session. Till then, bye.